For the last several years, I've been recommending three books to financial professionals to amplify their relevance to high value clients, especially in the areas of continuity, succession, family investment legacy, and all of those dynastic issues. And of course, those books are The Millionaire Next Door, Timeless, Every Family's Business, which is such an incredible playbook, and Beer Money, which is uh, quite a window into the minefield that can uh, come along with a privileged uh, economic family reality. There are examples and there are warnings, examples of families who get it right, warnings uh, around families who uh, misfire. But I will tell you, for the last couple of years, the book Entitle Mania, uh, that was put onto my radar in 2020 by Chris Jepson at First Trust. And uh, from that point, I have been telling everybody who will listen that this is absolutely essential reading when it comes to understanding, among other things, what can occur and what needs to be addressed when first generation earned wealth goes into motion and becomes second generation found wealth. And to that end, I, I couldn't be more excited to have the author of Entitle Mania, that that fourth book I was referring to. Richard Watts, thank you very much for carving out some time to have this conversation with us. Oh, you're welcome, Duncan. I'm, I'm very looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, likewise. Uh, one of the many things, and, and I mentioned to you in our last conversation that um, I had such an amazing experience with your book because my wife and I had to travel from Kelowna to Vancouver which is about a four and a half hour drive all in. And I told her about your book and she was instantly intrigued. So she downloaded it as an audio book and we listened to it on that road trip. And uh, so the content of the book is exceptional. It's very well put together. But now that I've gotten to know you a little bit, what I love is the origins of what went into that book because it's not theoretical. This is experiential. You've been working at a very high level with families to help them get it right. So I'd love to start there, if you don't mind sharing a little bit about your history that led up to this book. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, this this is a passion project for me, uh, as was the first book. You know, they're very similar uh, in nature. They came out of 40 years of representing as a lawyer some of the wealthiest families in the country. And uh, that sounded like a great honor in the beginning, and I still feel it an honor. Um, but, but in the process, I began to see duplications of problems in these families. And albeit they want me to take care of and protect their wealth, probably the more important thing that began to evolve from our discussions and my study of those families was they all wound up having the same problems with regard to the children, uh, with regard to inheritance. Uh, these things that they just get blindsided by. Um, and, and I've gone through generations. We've had quite a number of moms and dads pass away in the last 40 years. We do represent a number of third and fourth generation families. And you really begin to realize how much has been taken from these kids that then become adults that then take from their kids because these children have not been allowed to follow their own passions to figure out what damages there are in life that they can recover from. And they never learn to be agents of their own upbringing. They are always mm -hmm. being recognized as, you know, somebody that's not quite getting it right because the person above them always knows more. And so you never really grow up. You never get to be your own adult in these scenarios. And so that spawned the discussion, which then spawned a lot of lectures and then the book. And since then, um, I've traveled in number of countries going to families that are saying, please help me. Uh, we're scared. We've got all of this money now and we thought we were doing a great thing and we truly don't even know how to get rid of it. We don't know what to do. And so uh, that's that's a problem. That I think is it, at least once you recognize it, you're you're halfway home to doing something about it. So that's a good thing. You got to remain positive that if you begin to see this is a problem, then, you know, you can, you can begin to work on it proactively. So that's, that's my answer to that. 
Oh, that's fantastic. And um, to jump ahead in the spirit of beginning with the end in mind, I'll just paraphrase the world-class parental guru, Tom Selleck, (laughs) who said, (laughs) we're raising them to let them go. Yeah. And so empowerment is so incredibly powerful. Now, I'm going to assume that your phone has probably been ringing off the hook even more in the last couple of years when you factor in the forces of demography and you throw in a force majeure that has just been, in many ways, bewildering and created all types of ripple effects that have been um, emotionally, in some cases, devastating. Can I assume that you're busier than ever? Yeah, we're, we're I'm very selective because I want to make sure that it broadcasts to a lot of people. And I and I'm able to get to to situations where I can speak to, you know, hundreds of people at a time. But but no, there's no question that it's not only busier, um, but it's morphed. The morphing is is that in the process of looking at those same families that I've been with and studying for the last 40 years and I mean every day. Uh, their families through the COVID crisis did not fare very well because they mm-hmm. never dealt with anything that was so mind-boggling and so confining. They hadn't dealt with anything that was restrictive in nature. They weren't used to, you know, they hadn't they hadn't been not been able to pay their rent a couple of times in their life. They had never been in a position where they'd failed at a business. They didn't know what it was like to have somebody, an elephant sitting on your head and not having somebody else find a solution for them. And so here they sit through COVID and massive amounts of depression uh, in the the extended family uh, to the point where the parents came to me even yesterday and said, look it, I need to get an entire force handling not only my kids, but my grandkids. And I don't know what in the world is happening to us, but our whole family's coming unscrewed and I can't keep a lid on all of it. And this is an 80 year old parent that's still trying to take on all of the problems of their children. Um, and, and this one you can't solve, right? This is too devastating. COVID has been too reaching. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, some of the people that have done the fair, the, the best in this, even losing their jobs are people that just say, I've been here before, you know, I've been here before I can, I'll fix this. I'll get somewhere at some point. I'm not, I'm down, but I'm not out. And that's the kind of attitude you learn from failing repeatedly when you have to do it on your own. Okay, I do want to spend some time on that, but I wanted to jump ahead and talk about the role of the financial professional in this whole deliverable. So you think back, because I I, I never get tired of speaking to my long-term clients. These are people that have been in the business for 25, 35 years. And, you know, it's in the beginning, they started off as brokers. Uh, selling product, selling investments, being gauged by by rates of return, and it was very transactional. And now they've morphed and evolved to be consultants who are strategic and directional. And that goes beyond uh, advisory. So going away in commissions to a fee for serve relationship, but a big part of that fee worthiness is to add value-added services and a bedside manner that basically says, okay, I don't just manage money. I manage a business that creates a client experience and I manage people. Relationship management now is just as important as asset management. So with that, Richard, do you have any uh, insights on how a financial professional can start to have this conversation, start to position themselves as a value-added resource around this area or getting out in front of this issue? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I was just a number of years ago, right before COVID, there was a financial firm in Edmonton that flew me in and said, we really want you to talk to our richest clients and we want you to talk about all these things. And I remember I, I kind of cut across the grain. That was, that actually didn't happen until like nine o'clock at night. It's probably one of the later conferences I've ever get, given. So it was late at night and I thought, well, I'm going to have to hold these people for an hour, but I also want to hold the wealth managers too, right? I want to get the financial consultants. And uh, in the first line that I utilized in that conference was I said, uh, thank you for having me here. I see that there's a lot of wonderful people. I'm sure that all of you are very successful. And I see a lot of financial consultants around the back of the room and sitting with their clients. 
And I said, why are you all hiding? And I just let that float out there. And I said, why are you all hiding? I'm talking to the financial advisors. Why are you hiding? And I just let it steep out there. And I said, I'll tell you why. Because one, you have information from all of your experience that you would love to convey to your client. And two, you're afraid. And the reason you're afraid is that your business is about maintaining that client's wealth and maintaining that account. And you may just lose it if you give them advice that's contrary to what they want to hear. So my question again for all of you is, why are you hiding? And then I turned to the, to the people that were sitting with them and I said, the reason they're hiding is because you haven't given them permission. You, the client, have not given them permission. So let me start with this. Why don't you, the clients, after I'm gone out of here, if there's one thing you can do is ask, tell the wealth manager, look it, you can say whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind. I will always listen. I will never fire you because you say something about my kids or about my, my estate plan. I won't fire you for that. I want to hear it. I may not like what I hear, and I may tell you I don't, don't like what I hear, but I give you permission to give me your wisdom because that's something that I can get from you as an extra. And boy, it was amazing. You could hear a pin drop in the room, but it was something that I thought was really important to, to have the wealth advisor recognize that they, they just need permission. And so since that time, I've often told them what you should do is you should go to them and you say, look it, do you or do you not want me to counsel you outside of how to invest your money? If I see patterns, do you or do you not want me to do that? I'm willing to do it. I have a heart to do it, but I don't want to upset you. Are you willing to do, do you want that? And I've never heard anyone say no. They all say, absolutely. Because these are people they trust. And people that are very wealthy have circles that are very small and they don't trust a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so when you're in a position of trust, if you really want to indenture yourself, you go to those clients and you say, look, it, I, again, this is something you may not want to hear, but right now you're giving each of your kids $250,000 a year just as a bonus, just to give them money. And I've never seen a family not train wreck after five to 10 years when kids are given that kind of money and they don't have to work. And it'll, it, it implodes marriages, it implodes kids, it does this, it does that. And with that type of an invitation, I've had hundreds of reports back where they have actually become so um, close to their client as a result of that permission, because the client then really is getting that value add way beyond wealth management. You know, they get that, that counsel that is so hard to get with experience. And so uh, I've been very pleased. And I've had people say to me, wealth managers, I am never going to do that. I am never going to tell them a thing about their kids and I'm thinking of one guy right now that's one of the biggest in the United States. Um, I think he's in the top 25 of all wealth managers. And we do a lot of business together. And he has since, you know, changed that tune. And he just said, you know, it's not just about salesmanship. It's about morality. It's about doing the right thing to help people do good things. And so he said, I, I've changed my life because I feel now like I'm, I'm really somebody that's morally coaching my clients rather than just financially. That's that's profound. And uh, I don't know who said it, but something to the effect of you can assess someone's real intentions more by their questions than by their answers. And asking that question, why are you hiding? <laughs> um, that's that's absolutely incredible. I thought for sure when you mentioned Edmonton. Uh, you were going to make reference to the greatest hockey dad ever, Walter Gretzky, and you were going to talk about where the puck is going. <laughs> dir 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 directionally yeah. when you know <laughs> i thought for sure but you really caught me there i was just in winnipeg um a few days ago and again hockey central there as well but um the the morality that that's hand in glove with a sense of purpose uh, a financial professional's sense of purpose to prompt a client to think about all the dynamics around their legacy, not just how much money they have, but what it all does. And 
You know, it's interesting, Richard. I, I have many long-term clients who now have clients asking them, what happens to us when you retire, when you're gone? And I say to the financial professional, you know, the best way to be indispensable to a client with their continuity and succession issues is to address your own in real time. It's not just your opinions, it's your example, to paraphrase Charles Kettering. Uh, but, but that has many layers too, not just on the quantitative side of uh, estate planning and continuity session, but also the qualitative side. So uh, I want to explore this more to make this as actionable as possible. I do want to say this. What I really loved about Entitlemania was you didn't just talk about how to get out in front of this, this issue, but also what to do if you feel that you might have missed some opportunities and you're looking back in hindsight. You know that old expression, if you, if you raise your kids, you get to spoil your grandkids. If you spoil your kids, you have to maybe potentially raise your grandkids. Yeah, that's true. So I do want to talk a little bit about both getting out in front, but also what to do if maybe uh, there's been a couple of errors in judgment along the way, if you don't mind getting into some of those on both sides. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, let me address the, the going, going out first in advance, right? Perfect. Going out, that, that's a very unknown territory, right? That's something that people don't have any good intuitive sense. It's very counterintuitive that you should kind of plan for getting rid of your money before it gets inherited you know, or placing it in a place that it can't shower down on your children, that you should figure that out now. You should start to talk about it, you know, and, and believe me, in the beginning, uh, people don't do good. They don't do well with talking about this because it seems so counterintuitive. It seems so counterintuitive that they don't want to talk about it. They've spent their whole life putting together dollar by dollar by dollar mm -hmm. and watching it day by day by day. The thought that they're coming to the end at some point is is something they just don't want to face. And so it's it's almost um, abusive in my mind to not think about the future of your children after you're gone with the money that you leave. It's almost abusive to not give that consideration and go through the scenarios of what it might look like, you know, with somebody that knows what they're talking about. A lot of wealth professionals do do know that area. Uh, and, you know, most many of the estate planning lawyers that people rely on do not know that area. So it's who do you go to? Where do you get that information? Because, you know, people believe when they have a lot of money that when they go to an estate planning lawyer, he is the one to take care of all of their issues of succession. That's that's the guy. They're the ones that take care of who handles the money, who gets the money. And, and how it's dispersed over time and what the different mechanisms are. The fact is, is that every estate planning lawyer will, if he's being honest with you, will tell you they have no experience with how the money lands after mom and dad are gone, with the exception of the beginning and setting up of a distribution with a trustee that they then lose track of. And they're not monitoring the actions of the kids. They're just, they're just setting up a mechanism and their one driving issue for a estate planning and lawyer is tax savings. And all of them will tell you that. We are tax lawyers. We are here to maximize the amount of money going across the bridge to the next generation. We don't really think about, nor is it our job, they would say, to tell you what's going to happen afterward. So parent, parents come back from an estate planning lawyer saying, wow, we've got this thing all set up and it's all complex and we've got all these distribution, health support and maintenance issues, and we've got educational issues and, and all these things. And then you ask them a question, well, but when do the kids get control of all the money? Oh, well, I don't know. Well, did you read? Did you ask the lawyer? I mean, you've got all these provisions, but when does the kid? I don't know. That's a great question. Let me go ask that. Come back a couple of days later. Oh, well, they all get the money at 30. And I'm thinking, and I ask, do you? Remember when you were 30? And exactly how would you do at 30 
if someone handled you the equivalent of X, whatever that number is, none of them answer. Oh, they go, oh my gosh, I would have been a wreck. You know, so I say, okay, what do you do proactively to think about that? What are the things you need to think about? And it really does come down to, to asking the question of how little is too little to leave your kids as a starting point, rather than the typical starting point of how much is too much. Nobody knows the answer to how much is too much, because some kids will do really great. There's some kids that will take 10, 20, 50, 100 million dollars and they'll invest it and they'll live normally. And the next kid will be married three times, drugged out alcoholic that goes through failed business after failed business. And those kids were raised as siblings. So the question is, what if I left nothing? And of course, when I say that to people, even in lectures, they shudder. It's like, okay, I'm turning him off. I'm not listening to, to Watts anymore. I mean, that's enough. I've heard enough. That's crazy. How much is, you know, how little is too little? And then I ask the question, if you left your kids nothing right now, you had great experiences, you were a wonderful mom and dad, you did some nice things, but at the end, it all goes away. I'm not talking about where it goes and I don't care where it goes, but what if you left them nothing? And I ask that of every single one of my clients and they almost all say the same thing. Well, I, I mean, they'd be fine. They're pretty smart. They've become educated. They've done this, they've done that. We haven't given them a lot yet. I think they'd be fine. And I go, so then exactly what are you getting by giving them a lot of money? At least think about it. You know, what are you getting out of that? So you're going to give them each a million bucks. What are you getting for that? And they answer the same time. All it's all, always the same thing. I'm giving them a little easier road, a little less stress, and I'm giving them the chance to be a little happier without working so hard. You know, and, and as I say those things, anybody that's really worked for their money knows that those are fallacies. Giving a million dollars to make them a little happier doesn't do it. You know, it creates a dynamic where you begin to thirst for material things typically. Mm -hmm. And as you kind of go down that road, that's a real detour because that you can do that even worth a billion dollars. You start detouring with little things and that kind of is a quencher. But then you hear about a helicopter and that sounds really cool. Then you hear about an island home and that sounds really cool. And eventually you keep deviating away from the plain old vanilla simple things in life and you amass different things that are supposed to satisfy you. And in the end, you find out they don't. And they're not going to satisfy your kids any more than they satisfied you. So again, that, that's the proactive side of what to do. <clears throat> that's half your question. No, and phenomenal. So much there. And I jumped right to Maslow's hierarchy of uh, self-actualization that is, goes so far beyond how much money we have, but who do we become? And I think the unintended consequences of those good intentions of making life a little easier is that safety net becomes a hammock of entitlement. Right. And um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you what your thought is around why is it that so many first generation affluent people kick the can down the road? And uh, I, I think it comes back partially to what you said about they, they just don't have a lot of people they really trust. But also is it is an, el an element around their mortality like they don't they're not in at peace with the their mortality like they just think that okay i'm wealthy people admire me and uh i'll just delay this is that part of it yeah i i think i don't think it's thought out that well i think really people that are the wealth creators i call them the dam builders you know the people that actually take a stream and they construct the little dam across the stream and begin to catch water behind it right they begin to catch wealth behind the dam you know, those people are so proud. Mm -hmm. Much of their life, so, so much of their existence is built on and based on what they've attained. It's their board memberships. It's the people that they hang with. It's the assets that they have. Each one of those is a trophy room to look back on their life. And there's nothing wrong with this. This is what life is about, right? You, you're trying to collect trophies. You're trying to collect wins. 
And, you know, and, and each of these things, and then you look at someone else that's got a little different trophy and you think, you know, I'd like to have that too. Can I get it? Well, money, unlike playing golf, you know, you could be a lousy golfer and see a guy that's a good golfer and you'll never be a good golfer. But when you have money, if my trophy is, is a, is a, uh, is a vacation home at some incredible resort. And I see a guy that's got a 200 foot yacht. If I have money and he's got that trophy and I'd like to have a trophy like that, I can go get that trophy. And again, it's another collector. It's another thing that I put in my arsenal. And what happens is, is that people get older and it doesn't decrease the amount of pride they have in their accomplishments. And there again, I'm going to say it again, there's nothing wrong with that. People, you know, we all have, re- I'm really proud of what I've done. I started with nothing. And I had a dad that was really wealthy. And my dad said, guys, go out and do what you're going to do on your own, because I'm not going to leave you anything. Just want to let you know, I'm not, and that was 31 years ago. My mom died at 55 and my dad died at 67. And he made true on that promise. And mom, the kids all went off. Thank God we all had doctorates. We all had education. He told us, get ready. And when he left and nothing came, none of us were shocked. And we all are good friends. And my sister's a teacher. She never made more than 75 grand a year. She's just happy as a clam. I talk to her every two weeks. My brother's a car salesman in in Austin. You know, he's happy. He probably never makes more than 100 grand a year, US. He's really happy. He's he's, he's worked his whole life. My brother is a a lawyer turned judge and now semi-retired. We had lunch last week. We have lunch every two weeks. I mean, we're family. I can't say the same about family, the family next door that lived next door to us, who mom, when they died, gave it all to their kids. And they never talk because they're all mad. Someone got something more than another got here or there. Someone did something more with it or less or whatever. And none of them talk. They all hate each other. And this is one of my closest friends. But their family is completely disheveled. So, you know, I I come from your prior comment about you have to example what it is you intend your kids to do. And I, I think about mom and dad and I, and, I, and I can't believe the boldness of what it took to follow through on that. And, and it, it's inspiring to me because he was ahead of his time and he understood. And he just said, I've never seen anybody that inherited a bunch of money that was worth a tinker's dam, he said, right? First of all, Good distinction. A hundred thousand US, that's like a quarter million Canadian, I think. That's real yeah. money. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know. Not really. Uh, Not really. Uh, I love the dam analogy. Um that's 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 quite powerful. Um interestingly, you know, many many financial professionals, their core clients are in the sandwich. And I know of several who part of their fit process is they want to understand the origins of the money. I know financial professionals that will not bring on a prospective client who did not earn the money. Oh, interesting. I've never heard that. That's wonderful. Well, completely different attitudinal makeup. Well, and easier to manage. Easier to manage. Well, somebody who's earned the money yeah. understands delegation. Like, I don't hire you to micromanage you. I hire you to liberate me to go live my life and do what I do. That's a great point. But so the attitudinal components are are quite powerful. But um, why why is it? You talk about counterintuitive. Why is it that so much first generation earned money deprives the next generation of the friction and the hardships, all the things that they, so is it literally a conscious decision where they say, I don't want my kids to have to go through what I went through when it's because of what they went through and overcame that helped them attract that money. Why do they deprive them and shield them from the experiential learning? Yeah. I, I, um, I, I'm reminded of my good friend, Bob Woodson, who's a, who's an African-American is part of the Woodson center actually created 82 Mm -hmm. years old. that says 
He's on, on news all the time and has written quite a number of books. And uh, Bob Woodson says that in giving our kids everything we did have, excuse me, in giving our kids everything we didn't have, we oftentimes forget to give them what we did have. And the things we didn't have are typically monetary, right? The things we did have were the struggle and the difficulties and the strife. And we don't want our kids to have that part. But I, but to answer your question uh, more, more specifically, why is it that, a, that first generation money creators have such a counterintuitive failure about this money is going to make the, their kids happy that they don't, they don't really look into the possible problems of, of what that transfer is going, what's going to happen. Here's the sleight of hand that has caused them that belief. And that is they have grown incredibly proud, as I said earlier, of the things they've accomplished. They believe that pride is transferable. Wow. They truly believe that pride is transferable. You're my daughter. You're my son. You have no idea the pride that I have in the fact that I'm driving this nice car. If I give you a nice car to start with, even though I started with a used car that, you know, wouldn't run 100 miles without breaking down. If I start you with a with a brand new car when you're 16, when you're 18, when you're 21, if I give you that brand new car, you are going to be as proud of that car as I am of what I've attained in getting my new car. I can transfer my pride and I can transfer my estate to you. And that pride is going to transfer to you too. You're just going to sit around most of the days saying, I'm so proud that I have all of the things I have. And pride is not transferable. Pride must be earned and it must be earned from this place of tension um, where, where there is this tension and release, this, this difficulty, this failure, this setback, and then solution, and then setback, and then solution. And somewhere down the road, you go, whoa, I'm so tired, but I did it. I made it. And I didn't make it as good as I thought I would make it, but I made it a lot further up than I was back there. So I'm pretty feeling pretty good about where I'm at. That's what creates pride is the failure and solution, not here. Here's all the accoutrements of success that brought one person pride in a prior generation. Let me just transfer those to you because they will transfer. This pride will transfer. It's like title. It'll transfer to you. You'll own the pride and you'll just sit back and be proud, proud all the time. Does not transfer. And it's a train wreck. That's that's easily one of the most powerful things I've heard in a long time. And I think it reflects your balance uh, around the art and science uh, of of the role you play. That is very, very thought provoking. And I'm sure you've got some clients who they've left a conversation with you. And that's probably lingered in their mind for a long time. That concept, um, you know, I'm just going to make this somewhat personal for a second. Uh, my wife uh incredible like she she made our kids have skin in the game they had to pay for their own cell phone early they had to have a jobs early uh taught frugality through example uh you know to the point now where my kids it's the old scottish right they've got deep pockets but short arms right like they <laughs> they they just don't want to part with their money cuz they've earned the money they've got skin in the game right, right. um you know, it's interesting. So I think it was Carl Jung who said that uh, the biggest burden we can place on our kids is to live your unfulfilled life through them. That is by, by in some way connected to your point about pride is not transferable or unfulfilled you know, whether it's hindsight, regrets, or uh, things that have been sort of not accomplished, you're trying to uh, impose that. Uh, I'll tell you, a powerful book, and I gave it to my kids uh, many years ago, Extreme Ownership. I, I, I'm not saying this is at the top of the list, but it's got to be close. The concept of absolute personal responsibility, the self-awareness for personal responsibility. 
that's something we cannot deprive. And that's not something they can learn in a simulator. That has to be something that they get out there and it's, you know, fail when the consequences are small and get a sense for what that feels like. So you can have a workaround. I've got to think that's toward the top of the list. Yeah. And and the other thing too, is that you and I have been talking about about learning to be successful in managing money, learning to be successful in managing assets and you know the estates and what are the kids, how are they going to do it if they don't know how? There's another big factor that I think is is really even bigger than the acumen of of learning how to take care of yourself, and that is that when money is brought in to insulate kids and mom and dad think they know a pathway of success better than the kids, they don't allow kids to identify their own passions. And I think that is probably mm. the most insidious of all of this is that what we want more than anything is if my child wants to be a ballet dancer, if my child wants to really work hard and own a lawnmower shop, if my child, you know, really has a dream about being a musician, you know, I want him to follow those passions. I may counsel him that if you're going to be a musician, you know, you're going to have to probably understand that that art is going to cost you in lifestyle, but that's your choice. I'm going to let you make it. But to not let a child learn what a passion might be is really taking away the happiness of the child. I don't care whether you teach them productivity and managing money or not. You know, if you're putting a hood over them and not allowing them to try things that they might be good at, I've I've been uh, there. There's a, a my youngest son, Russell, um, is now 35, 36 years old. And uh, and he's in the book. He's one of the he's the one that we kicked out of the house after allowing him to live at home for a year. But the story about Russell was, is that, you know, at 27 years old, um, we were in Hawaii and he had said to me, Dad, I'm I've been bleeding out of my rectum off and on for like six months. And. I've gone to the doctor and he just says, I must have a hemorrhoid or something. And I said, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow that to stand. So as soon as we get back, I'm going to take you to our gastro and he, and I did. And he said, ah, you know, I mean, he's a 27 year old kid. And I said, look at doc, just scope him. And he said, nah, you know, I, I don't need to scope him because he, I mean, he doesn't come on. He's 27. I said, just scope him. So he did. And he couldn't finish it because he had such a large tumor cancerous tumor inside of his colon at the age of 27 that he couldn't get the scope up. And this doctor that I'd known for years came out and he said, your son's got colon cancer and it's bad. And we sat there with him and just kind of collapsed around him. And he had surgery and had a foot of his colon taken out. He had chemotherapy for a year. And during that process, we this is the one we kicked out five years earlier and was doing great. But he was living in an apartment and we said, look, we think it's probably best for you to go home, to come home. We're down the street, 10 miles. You're going to be all alone. You're hugging the toilet at night. He's sleeping around the toilet where he actually wakes up in the morning around the toilet. And he said to me, he goes, dad, he says, you know something? Every night that I'm around that toilet, that I wake up at three in the morning after being sick from the chemo, he says, I'm becoming a different man that I didn't know before. And he says, I don't want to go home. I don't want to stop that process. I want to learn who that guy is. Now he's seven or eight years post. And it is remarkable how strong this guy is. I mean, he can walk into situations where people are ill. He can talk to people that are ill. I don't know how to talk to a guy that's got cancer, 30-year-old or 40-year-old. And he walks right in and he says, I know how you're feeling. And so he has this entire ministry aside from his work, that's a passion for him. And in seven years, he's changed the world. I've had more people come to me and say, that guy is like a 90-year-old living in a 30-year-old body. The only way we get that is when we let them find those places on their own. And sometimes as smart parents, we need to almost push them away and we need to remove ourselves, not just hover, not be the drone parents that we are, but we need to just allow them to do. Now, if he wanted to come home and that was safer for him, that would have been fine. But the fact that he said what he said allowed me to say to him, and I said it to him about two years ago, and we were out to lunch together. And I said, you know something, son, you, I no longer can counsel you in the world that you live in. And he says, what do you mean, dad? I said, you, I said, you have grown beyond my years. 
And he just started crying and he goes, wow, dad. And I said, understand you have had experiences I have not had and I do not know. You can help people and do things that I do not know. So God bless you and keep doing what you're doing because I'm watching and I'm just proud as heck. But see, that's that's properly supporting to me a kid that was 10 years ago a problem. Now he's like he's like the leader of the family and in so many ways. That is very moving. I appreciate you sharing that. And, you know, not to overanalyze it, but if you reverse engineer to that tough love back when he was 22, 23, you probably empowered him to a degree. And then he, uh, he blossomed uh, from the standpoint of, no, no, I've got this. That's, thank you. That's uh, significant. Um, I mean, the words matter. You, you, you say some things that are incredibly direct. How, how does a financial professional uh, bring this up? I mean, can they be that direct with a client? I guess it depends on the degree of trust without fear of maybe irreparably harming the relationship. I mean, how, how can they, how can they go there? Well, I think you have to be, you have to be transparent. I think you have to say, as I said earlier, you have to, you have to take it in steps. You certainly don't want to, you don't want to come on. Even when we have a new family, you know, we have a couple of young families that we've brought on in the last several years that are in their twenties that have already made a half a billion US dollars on their own. And it is mind boggling. And I can't just go to them and say, you're going to be a lotto winning train wreck if you don't listen up. You know, it takes time to get that trust, to have them understand. And I ask them every time I'm with them, I say, look it, I'm twice your age. I know a lot of stuff. You hired me to manage what goes on. Do you want me to tell you what I see or don't you? Oh yeah, Richard, I want I want you to tell me everything you see. You know, I want I want you to I want you to do that. Okay. And then I just started in little doses and and uh, and and then, you know, begin to increase it to where they know little by little. And it probably takes me a year to get up to speed and I've got clients I've represented 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I can say anything to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got other clients, let me be fair, that I can't be this way with. I have a couple of clients that, you know, that are that are 60 years old, that are worth lots and lots of money, but their kids are so messed up that, and I've told them, and they'll, they, they don't even want to ask because I kind of told them what was going to happen, and now it's happened, and I never say I told you so. I don't care. I'm just here to help from where we are now. Let's go forward, and one of those clients this addresses the second question that we didn't answer before that you asked mm -hmm. me. And that is, what do you do when you've already gone down the road the wrong way? I actually said to that client, I said, look at what you need to do is right now you're going to, these kids are going to be inheriting huge amounts of money each. Mm -hmm. Is that really what you want? How, how has it worked out so far? And I said, if you want to make it switch, there's nothing wrong with making a change now. So when the kids were about 45, which is probably 10 years ago now, she went to them and say, she said, here's my fortune. I'm going to leave you X, which it was in my mind, still quite a lot of money. It was in the millions, but it wasn't anywhere near the, the breadth of the fortune. And I'm going to leave you this much and that's it. So plan on it. Here you go. And that was not enough for them to live the lifestyle that they're living now forever. So in other words, if she died 10 years ago, that money would have run out probably in five to 10 years. And these, these boys were in their forties and it really scared them. Um, and they, we had a big family meeting and she said, this dad's already dead. This is what I'm doing. I am limiting your inheritance. Here it is. So you got a lot of years to figure it out, but this is what you're getting and that's it. So it's interesting because within a couple of six months, all of them had gone back to education in their later years or they'd started really enterprising where they where they might have done when they were 20 and 30, they stopped doing what they were doing and they kind of picked that back up again. And one of the young, the youngest of the, of the boys uh, called me about maybe two years later, which is now seven or eight years ago. 
And he said, you know something? He says, I really was upset because I knew that some of this counseling came from you to cut us off. But he said, I got to tell you, I went back to school and he said, I've been two years at this. And he says, I'm stunned how smart I am. He says, I'm a 45 year old in class with a bunch of 20 year olds. And I'm so desirous of getting it right. And I have such a motivation. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're doing. I'm already mature enough. And I know I'm not going to have enough money to live the lifestyle I want. I got to get going. And he says, I've been getting straight A's in class. And he said, and I want to confess something to you. He says, you know, up in the heights above the ocean where I live, blah, 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 blah. He said, you have no idea in the last five years before mom made this restriction how many times I drove my $300,000 Porsche up onto the heights, sat on the bluff of the heights, and just cried about how horribly unhappy I was with my life. The women that came into my life because I had money and they left. And the people that came into my life because I treated them to stuff and they left. And he said, now, he says, it's every man for themselves. I got to do my own thing. I got to get productive. And he said, I feel so good. He says, I sold that doggone car. And now I'm driving an $80,000 new car that's just as good. And I could just hear all of this sense, all of this application of wisdom that was right under the current, right under the right under the skin of this person. And all of them did the same thing. They all got productive. And now mom's, you know, I talked to mom yesterday and, you know, she's so much happier because all the kids are happy and they're all talking to her. They didn't like her when she was giving them all the money, right? But now they understand that the tough love of a parent doesn't just stop when you die. The tough love of parents got to be set up so that it's tough. Even when you're gone, you got to make the right decision. So it's a it's a great testament to being able to reverse on, on things that are already down a certain road. Well, as a parent, um, I, I think enlightenment ultimately means to your point, you can you can honor your tangible accomplishments, but from a fulfillment perspective, like your experience with Russell and that experience, the Porsche and the bluffs. I mean, so it's achieving that best version of yourself, seeing somebody, your your offspring get to that level. I, I can't imagine anything more fulfilling. Now Interesting. You talked about if your kid wants to become a musician. I had a bit of a flashback. Um, way back when in Edmonton, there was a jazz bar, jazz club called the Yardbird. And that was my introduction to jazz. I had some friends that introduced me to some jazz listening on a CD. It sounded neat. Went to the Yardbird. And uh, there's this small band. They were just exceptional. And the lead was so incredibly funny and smart and so in between songs he was cracking jokes and talking about life and i'm like i'm looking around he was a he was older than i was there might have been 150 people in the room and i'm just doing the math like this guy is so much more capable of other things he pointed to his girlfriend his girlfriend was beaming and he did crack a joke. He said, uh, he said, uh, what do you call a jazz musician without a girlfriend? And he said, homeless. <laughs> and it occurred to me, like, <laughs> that's good. He could probably go out and make more money elsewhere, but he was doing what he loved to do. And I think as a parent, uh, that has to be what we're trying to help foster to some right. degree. Right. Um, I know you're very tight for time, so I want to respect that. Uh, I do want to make a reference to Entitle Mania because I know there are several financial professionals who have built that into their client experience, whether it's their onboarding process or their uh, Christmas gifts or um things that they've used to sort of amplify the bedside manner giving to their clients. Um, so I'd like you to talk about that if you don't mind, and also where the proceeds of that book go. 
Yeah. So, so it's obviously the message is what's important to me and it's, it's in all forms, right? It's electronic, it's in hardback and it's in audio. Uh, and oftentimes I think it's, it's uh, what I've seen happen. I've had wealth management firms in New York and whatnot buy enough for all of their clients and also give them an audio version as well. So that if they really aren't going to read, because how many books are you given and how many of those books do you really read that you have an audio version that allows you to listen in the car um, and I think it's relatively capturing. They just need to get a chapter in and it will be relevant to them that I think it it could be meaningful. Um, and uh, and in terms of the money, you know, all of the lecturing and all of the book, uh, all the proceeds since the beginning of my books uh, go to charity. So I, I'm not really in the business of selling books. I have a day job managing all of these families. But truly, like we talked about the passion versus the other, I get to be passionate in my job but the book side and, and the lecturing and imparting this information to people is my passion. And it's a stealth ministry for me because I really do believe it's the most important thing that faces this, this generation that we have with $30 trillion. It's truly a inheritance tsunami that's coming. And, uh, and people are just sitting back going, as long as I'm gone, am I going to be here when the tsunami hits? Well, heck no. Well, then you know what? I don't have to worry about it. And the fact is, is yes, you do. So uh, so I would encourage anybody and everybody. And, I, and I've, uh, I've had a lot of people put me in contact with speaking engagements that uh, allow me to come out. And I've done hundreds of those in several different countries. And uh, it's always meaningful to me because I think people's lives are changed. And this is something that we all need to think about. We all need to give thought to. Well, and to your point, just coming full circle about um, helping a family engineer a legacy that's multifaceted, not just the number. Um, these are, it's a storm of, of demography and there's an unmet need there. So it's, it's just as much about the financial professional's responsibility as it is to uh, quantifiably what it can earn them. Uh, right. Because, you know, we want obviously these these professionals to thrive, but adding that meaning and purpose and, and the dynamic of it's a calling that that's an unmet need that can be addressed. I do want to mention. Um, so so I, I encourage every financial professional to read Entitle Mania, consider adding it into the repertoire, a part of your process uh, to start the conversation with clients. Um, going forward, I, I will mention I've had Richard. I, have you read the book, The Art of Racing in the Rain? No, I have not. So I'm mentioning that because that is an incredible story. It's a story told through the eyes of a dog about his owner, who is a race car driver. Okay. And it, it didn't come easily. They, they had incredible skill. And one of his skills was the ability to win races while the conditions were not favorable. Mm -hmm. But the story takes him through the journey of being a, being an underappreciated race car driver, then uh, getting married, dealing with some curveballs there, then becoming a dad, and staying true to the purpose, and and then watching toward the end how he was looked upon by others in terms of how he overcame things. It's such a powerful book mm. that I think would be a great bookend to entitle mania because it's a story that is can be augmented by some great insights that you provide. So uh, we did not get to everything I wanted to talk to you about, <laughs> but this was so great uh, oh, from so me as a, as a dad. Thank you very much. And I can't yes, wait to Duncan, share this welcome. with our community. So yeah, Richard, very, thank very you welcome. very much. Sounds good. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And anything I can do to help you, let me know. I really appreciate that. You're on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah. I don't use it a whole bunch because I'm too okay. busy to, to be involved with that, but I've got a staff that that uh, posts on Facebook and under Richard Watts author, we'll post different sayings and different opportunities and sometimes lectures that I've given in different places, that sort of thing. So, okay. So we'll post this and circulate it uh, on those platforms and uh, feel free to chime in when you see it go live. Okay. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs>